Welcome to Faithway Baptist Church this great Sunday morning. Let's stand together and sing glory to his name. It's 195 in the hymns, uh, or you can look it up to the screen. Glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides with where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Was my blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to his name he's worthy of it uh, he lives is our next song 150 we're entering you know, resurrection sunday easter uh, sunday we're celebrating this because he lives he rose again i serve a risen savior i serve a risen Love 
and Savior. Today, if any of you brought carrot cake, Ray Farrell is taking it, and uh, he's seeing who is the next carrot cake champion of Faithway Baptist Church, and uh, we're excited about that. Um, today also is choir practice at one point. We're, I'm so thankful for all of you that are doing that, if we're missing some. Uh, thankful for all of you that are faithful and coming, and and at a ministry and helping us worship the Lord in song. That's at 145 today, getting ready for March 31st, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, I know as believers, we celebrate resurrection every day, but this is a special day. Historically, this is the day where Jesus rose from the grave and gave us hope of eternal life. And I'm thankful that we can come together and, and worship him as a congregation, inviting friends. We have a group, a bunch of tracks back uh, several hundred tracks out into the area, uh, but we have some invitations and tracks back there. If you would take some, invite your friends and neighbors uh, that you want to be saved or hear a gospel message, and uh, and and I, uh, just statistically, if I'm going to uh, help us this morning, statistically, people are more likely to come if a friend invites them to come and hear the gospel message. You may not know how to structure the uh, the gospel. We we can teach you in that, but in the meantime. Uh, just invite them on the back of the card in the gospel, uh, gospel message. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, our faith in him. But bring them this next Sunday. The gospel will be preached, and we're excited to see people, cha their lives changed because of that same message. All right, so those are, that's what's going on. 1 Corinthians 6.14 is our memory verse of the month. Uh, and in fact, this is going to be, uh, the la I don't know if we're going to do it next week or not. I can't remember what I've scheduled for that, but um, let's just treat this as our last time, okay? 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 14. Uh, let's look together uh, with looking twice, and then we'll take it off out. Ready? And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by power. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Again, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his power. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Ready? And God will also raise us up by his own power. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. I don't know why. That always happens, a second word. It's a tricky one. No, it's just me, right? You, I mess it up. And God hath both raised up the Lord, all right, and will raise us up at the last. That's what we celebrate here at uh, Resurrection uh, Time. We celebrate the fact that he rose again, and because he rose again, he also promised us up that believe in him in the last time. Can't wait for that. All right, we do have uh, a missions highlight. Uh, Ken is going to come and and uh, give us a missionary update on the Bickle family to Costa Rica. So thankful for them. Uh, here at Faithway, when you give to missions, uh, it goes to the missionaries that we uh, voted on and, and chosen to support. Uh, we don't have to go through a clearinghouse that takes a percentage of that. We go, it goes directly to them. Uh, so thank you for coming and presenting this. <clears throat> This is the uh, Bickle family from Costa Rica, and they are our missionaries. And <clears throat> the first paragraph, they said they wanted to thank everybody for all the prayers and uh, generosity that uh, enabled them to do the things that they did. And <clears throat> then they proceeded to say several things that they did. Christmas season, our outreach to the Las Rosas was a beautiful reminder of God's provision and power, along with a regular Bible study. Um, they had activities. They uh, hosted a Christmas party in the park, and all the neighbor, all, 
A-L-L, all the neighborhood kids were <coughs> given food and uh, uniforms for the, uh, for the Christmas uh, party. And the heartwarming thing about the whole thing was that one family, they, <coughs> they supported the little girl in the family had cancer. She had courageously uh, stopped the cancer or was working on the cancer she had one eye missing so that's a that's a rough thing for a little um, family to uh, have and um, not only to distribute gifts but share the gospel and the planting of seeds in hope and faith in their hearts and they had vacation bible school and uh, it was a rewarding time of learning and growth uh, deborah and i uh, um, had the of the youngest children and preteens for over four days. They, an encounter with Jesus was brought to them, and uh, they brought 50, around 50 kids, uh, the culminating in uh, a graduation. And many parents came and heard the gospel. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and then witnessing of the younger teens trying to step up and show leadership and uh, and uh, the particularly the leadership and the training step the enthusiasm and the growth and faith are good examples for the younger children okay and then teen camp they had teen camp too and uh, it uh, the theme of teen camp was be different for jesus uh, was another highlight of drawing teens to the rural area arena arena i don't know who arena is but Arena and I were blessed to spend two days filled with fun activities of preaching, Bible memorization, and heartfelt decisions about the faith. <laughs> and it was a powerful time, especially for a brother and a sister who decided to follow Christ. These two decided to follow Christ admits the, admit, ad, because of their family's uh, problems. <laughs> I can't pronounce it. Okay, so we continue in prayer for all the teens and for them. So if you're going to pray for somebody, pray for the two kids that came to Christ. <clears throat> and then Costa Rica uh, school starts in February. What, what's our start in? September? But theirs starts in February. So uh, <clears throat> your generosity reached spiritual nourishment and practical needs through the donation of school supplies and uniforms they they <coughs> had a goal of 15 kids 5 10 15 what their goal was what they what they actually did they actually did 28 kids 28 kids and <coughs> they were ensuring they're equipped with uh, su school supplies and uniforms for the new year uh, surplus funds were even allowed uh, to provide supplies for high school so they had some money left over for high school kids in the very needy area of Palo Grande. And uh, the support material, uh, uh, it's a message to these children and families that they are loved by God. <clears throat> okay, and we are profoundly thankful for your partnership in the gospel. Your prayers, support, and encouragement continue uh, uh, enable us to continue God's work here in Costa Rica. Pray for the family. Uh, the Bickle family, uh, they are in Costa Rica. I love that. Thank you, Ken. That was great. We, the Bickles are ones we don't hear from often, but when we hear from them, they tell us everything that's going on. I'm thankful for all they're doing. I'm going to ask the guys to come forward. Uh, uh, to take our to serve us in our offerings today, thank you so much to, give, uh, to those of you who give faithfully here at Faithway Baptist. Uh, we know you're given to the Lord. We desire to see those funds used in a way that glorifies Him, reaches others with the gospel of Christ, and helps us grow in our knowledge. Um, let's pray now for the Bickles and then for this offering. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for giving us such a great testimony of of how your gospel works around the world. It's not just uh, narrowed down to us. It's not narrowed down to uh, specific 
groups, it's, uh, it's meant to be preached to every creature. And I think that it's powerful. And thank you that it works uh, to change lives. Help these that have been saved to dedicate their life to growing in your grace and, and, your, and the knowledge of you. Help us now as we have, are here to give uh, financially to support these missionaries and local church. Help us, Lord, to do so in love and really just joy that our funds that you have given us are going to your cause. Be with us now as we continue uh, worshiping you in song and uh, in, your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can stay seated as the in Christ alone. It's Him alone that saves us. And by the way, if you want to live victoriously in the Christian life, it's through Him alone. And so let's remember that as we sing Holy, 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 one of my favorite hymns of all time.
be seated and take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verses 8 to 22. Thank you, Jennifer, for playing this morning. Ken, great, uh, really great missions highlight. I'm so thankful that we got to learn about the Bickles. I pray for them. By the way, they didn't mention all the health issues that they've been going through. Pray for them. Both and the wife have had serious health issues in the last few years, uh, as, and they continue to minister. They continue to think of Jesus and others first, and what a great testimony they have. Behold the King, uh, Matthew chapter 8. We're looking at the cost and the conclusion of following Jesus. And, and in that title, I've got to make kind of a, uh, an insert here. The conclusion as far as, like, this is it. This is the only passage we're looking at. We're looking at the conclusion as, what's the end of following Jesus? Uh, and, and I don't know, kind of have an idea what that is. But as we look through this, we're going to have two, uh, two people that come to Jesus with, a, uh, with an excuse. And uh, Jesus warns them and gives them uh, really just an upfront, open, uh, almost a harsh uh, uh, warning. Like, if you're going to follow me, this is what's going to happen. And so that's what we're looking at uh, today. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. Jesus has just healed uh, 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 Mary, uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, and, and now all these people are coming to him. He's he cast out demons. He's healed people. And now, verse 18, now when Jesus... Uh, great multitudes about him. He gave commandment to depart. That's the other side of the, the sea from where he is of Capernaum. And so just to put it in context, he says, And a certain scribe said unto him, Master, I will follow thee where, whithersoever thou goest. That sounds great. Master, I'll follow you uh, wherever you go. And then Jesus saith unto him, Foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to bury my father. And this is kind of a harsh saying. You know, this uh, next saying that Jesus says, Jesus said unto him, uh, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. That almost, you know, that's almost like, where is that uh, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus that wouldn't hurt a fly? Uh, where'd he go? Because this seems pretty harsh. To put your, uh, your, your family in the grave? Don't you want to take care of your, your household? And, and, and we need to explain what's going on in this text so that we can uh, properly understand why Jesus seems to be so harsh on this when all he said was, I'm, gonna go put, I'm just going to go to a funeral. Uh, and in our mind, it seems like it's just going to be a day thing because most funerals are. But that's not how it was. We need to understand in the cultural context of that day. All right, let's pray because we need his help, and then let's get into the cost of discipleship. God, you are worthy of us. We are not worthy of you. God, I pray that as we worship you today, you'd minister to every one of us. You'd help us to see the cost of following, uh, following Jesus and then see the conclusion and that it's worthy. Thank you that we can go through the heartaches and the trials of life by our side if we... Uh, our believers of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today as we get ready for our Easter uh, celebrations next week, as we get ready for this week where should be a time of really uh, completion as a believer, should be a time of uh, remembrance of what you did for us so that we can have eternal life. I pray that we would take the time day in and day out this next week just build our relationship with you and may this be a springboard for that i pray this in jesus name amen as we go about our lives many times we do things just out of kind of muscle memory right uh, there are things i do every day that are kind of like muscle memory i, I get up i, I want uh, brother Farrell. we were talking about dr rass coast baptist college and how disciplined he is uh, there are things he does that I think, how in the world can he do that? He gets up at like 3 in the morning, I don't know. And he goes and reads his Bible, writes a hundred different cards to a hundred different people uh, every day, and then he works out. He just got this whole list of things that he does now by muscle memory. Uh, we all have things we do by muscle memory, whether that's waking up and hitting the snooze button. I'm guilty of that. Uh, 15 different times, right? Snooze button. So you're retired, you're like, I could do that. I'm all right. Uh, some of you, when you were working, you're like, I got time. I got time. And then you're hustling to get to work. You're calling and saying, I'm going to be five minutes late. And there's Starbucks over here. So now you're going to be 15 minutes late. And uh, you get your favorite thing. And you go 
and uh, some of us uh, are still doing uh, uh, work over uh, from home. And so you don't care what time you wake up, just as long as you log in and roll back over and go to sleep, right? There are things we do from muscle memory, and, and each and every one of us have developed habits. And so uh, what we need as believers is to understand that Jesus is going to break the bad muscle uh, memory, if you use that term, and build godly ones in his place. That's the point of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Now, we all fail at doing, New Year's is, oh, I don't know, how many months away, and we all do New Year's resolutions. You know what my mom's favorite New Year's resolution is? Never to do a resolution again in her life. She hits that one every time. Uh, we all do different things to try to make ourselves better, but what Jesus is doing in this context is helping two people who have false ideas about who he is and what he's going to do uh, understand the reality that following Jesus doesn't mean your life is going to be easy. Make it hard. Uh, by the way, if you're here today thinking that if you put your faith in Jesus, all your troubles are going to go away, I'm sorry to help you with something this morning uh, that if you put Jesus, the only difference is, is that you get to go through the trials and tribulations with Jesus by your side. Uh, that's not comforting. I don't know what is. We could do it without him or with him. I'd rather do it with him. Uh, the reality is in this text, I want us to see this telling somebody, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to follow me, you need to count the cost. And part of counting the cost is having a dedicated relationship with him. Have a dedicated relationship with him. None of us will do this 100% of the time, but this first in our lives, we will understand and we will be able to make other decisions wisely and for the, uh, and, and for the glory of his name. Uh, Matthew uses this text. Uh, he says, as the, uh, in verse 19, he says, certain came unto him and said, Master. Now this word uh, is, an, is also translated teacher uh, in, in Matthew. And, and as Matthew uses teacher throughout his uh, throughout his context, he often uses it when people call Jesus a uh, teacher or rabbi, and he uses it to people who aren't 100% behind him as being God, as behind him as being the Messiah that has come to save Israel, the world, from their sin. And so it, it's kind of a play on words for him. It's didaskala, and, and it means just somebody who has instruction and wisdom uh, and is interested in helping others learn. So this scribe, who himself is a student of the Bible, uh, himself understands the Old Testament probably through and through, and he comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, um, uh, I'll follow you anywhere. Now, we don't really know what motivated this, te this man, this scribe, to come to him, but it seems like he was zealous. It seems like he was uh, wanting, to, um, wanting to be of something bigger than himself and he saw that Jesus had the potential maybe uh, to do what what he said he was going to do bring in the kingdom of God uh, maybe he was just somebody who says all right he maybe looked at the disciples and says okay you have a tax collector you have somebody good at, at administration you have you have Peter here who's uh, just a go getter and and and, uh, and then you have some of these other guys who are just um, you know they're just kind of so-so but I'm a scribe what you need, Jesus, is you need somebody who knows the law and can connect you to everybody, uh, who has some kind of uh, uh, promiscuity, not promiscuity, has some kind of uh, um, uh, fame and, 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 and standing in this community. That's what you need. And I'm going to go with you wherever you go. And we're, let's go set up this kingdom. Now, he may not have said that, but then in my mind, I'm seeing him come to him and saying, you don't have what you need, Jesus. You need me. You need me. Tell you, if you're coming to Jesus and saying, oh, you're so lucky to have me, uh, you're going to be lost. You're not going to be able to do much for Jesus. You can do a lot for you, but you can't do much for Jesus. This scribe doesn't even, they don't even give this scribe's name. That's how insignificant he really is in this grand scheme of things. But Jesus looks at this man, and I'm thankful he still has some uh, uh, some compassion him, and he gives him a warning. So before I get to the warning, I want us to understand that this man comes to him and says, teacher, um, I, 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 got, I got a great deal for you. Everywhere you go, I'll promote you. I'll do some work for you. I'll do whatever. Let's, let's set up this kingdom. And we need to understand that just a couple decades before, the zealots of the Jewish 
uh, uh, the Jewish nation had risen up against Rome and caused so much damage to try to relieve themselves from the Roman Empire. The Ro Rome came in and completely sieged the city, destroying hundreds of Jewish people, thousands of Jewish people, causing a, a, a real problem until Rome became uh, the official ruler of Jerusalem and then brought their own uh, presidents, if you will, in and brought their own governors in to control the chaos that the Jewish zealots had caused. And so this zeal that he has is, is more likely like we're going we're gonna to throw off the bonds of the Roman government, Jesus, right? We're going to do that together. I'll be, I'll be somebody who's... I'll be a right, your right-hand man. And the scribe comes in, and you have to understand, as he comes into this position, saying, I am going to help you. I'm going to bring in this kingdom. Uh, you, you have to understand the deflation that Jesus is about to do to him. Because now the zealot is saying, we're going to be up here living like kings. And Jesus says, look at this next verse, verse 20, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. This does several things for this scribe. First of all, the scribe knows the Old Testament. The scribe knows that when he says the Son of Man, he's not referring to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. He's referring to the deity of Jesus, of himself, he's saying, I as God in the flesh, I don't have a place to put my head at night. I don't have fame and fortune like you're desiring. And the scribe would understand that when he said the Son of Man, he's referring back to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14 in our Bibles. He, this is what it says. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, uh, and they brought him before him. And... And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall be not uh, that which shall not be destroyed. So as he's saying, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, he's telling this guy, Gee, the Messiah is come not to claim this victory physically but spiritually become the one who dies for you. So the scribe would get it. We in our westernized mentality, when we hear that, we just kind of, we kind of guess. We're like, oh, why do you say that? It just doesn't make sense. All right, we're going to go through some hard times. Maybe that's what we get. But Jesus is connecting the scribe to something far deeper in doctrine. It's the fact that if you follow Jesus, you're going to have some problems in this current life. He's saying that I am the, the God. I am the Messiah that you're looking for, but the Messiah you're looking for isn't, isn't set up the way you want him to set up. And if we set God, if we tell God to do everything we want him to do, we are going to miss the greatest blessing of all, fellowship with him. And so this, this relationship with God, I want us to understand, this dedicated relationship we need to understand has to sometimes put ourselves down. We need to put our... In fact, the Bible tells us to bring our, to cast our imaginations down as strongholds before the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to let him be captive before him. I, I don't know uh, about you, but I, I if, but me, I have some grand ideas in, in my realm. I want to do amazing things, uh, but the reality is, is God made me not want to do those things. But he does want to glorify himself. Do we understand here the dedicated relationship we need uh, it, uh, is is something that we need to sacrifice our ideas about what God is going to do with our lives and accept what God is going to do through us. Not us, but may sometimes in spite of us. Do you know that the spiritual gifts, believers, when you get saved, God gives you spiritual gifts. Those spiritual gifts, if you're exercising, it does not show your spiritual maturity. It just shows that God is you and sometimes in spite of you. If you knew... Uh, uh, had some people were and God still uses them you'd say why but God says because it's not about them it's about him it's about him and that's what Jesus is telling this guy in fact I want us to understand uh, that this is another uh, another time when in John chapter 6 as Jesus was uh, giving an illustration about the fact that he is the bread of life he's the 
manna from heaven that people need to consume. We need to, uh, we need to accept Christ as our Savior in order to be saved. And, and, and they thought he was talking about cannibalism, and many went away. And they had this discussion, and Jesus turned to those 12 that were with him, and he asked this question. He says, will ye also go away? Will ye also go away? Many left him. He had hundreds of followers, and now he's down to 12 being deflated he looks at him and he wants to make sure of their dedication to him are you in this relationship will you go away look what simon peter says he answered him lord to whom shall we go thou hast the words of eternal life and we believe and are sure that thou art the christ the son of the living god this isn't just a teacher he's god Jesus isn't just a great instructor or a wise person to help you in your morality. He's God who created you and gave you morality so that you might know there is a God, so that you might come to him by faith and receive Christ as your Savior and be free from sin, forgiven, and now have a dedicated relationship with him. If you want to follow Jesus Christ, it's not about just lightly following him. On, on Easter Sunday or some Sunday, it's about daily taking up your cross and following him. And it's something we need to decide to do. By the way, even if you're saved, you could decide not to follow Jesus. You, you, all right, I accept the free gift of salvation. You can still live your life as wicked as the day is long, and he'll be gracious enough to save you because it's not about you. It's about his promise to you. If you get him, he'll save you. But can I tell you, you're going to live a lot happier and a lot a lot uh, uh, maybe you'll have some sorrows and heartaches in fact i guarantee you'll have sorrows and heartaches but you can go through those sorrows and heartaches as somebody who has a rich relationship with the god who created you and allows you to go through those things as a testimony to his glory you decide to have your relationship dedicated to jesus christ and i want us to understand that as jesus is confronting this scribe this wise guy who is <laughs> that, that's not right right a wise guy you wise guy maybe he was i don't know uh, he's just kind of confronting him and saying look uh you don't understand the full ramifications of what you claim you want to do i'll follow you wherever you go i have decided remember that song i have decided to follow jesus though the world uh is against me i will follow the reality is, is the world is against Jesus. We may not see it in, 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 in everyday life. We may just kind of go about our lives thinking uh, all is grand and all is great, but there is a force out there. There is a principality and power that is against the gospel of Jesus Christ, is against God himself and all his people. And there is a spiritual battle that we are in. But if we follow Jesus, it doesn't matter if we don't have a, a place to put our head. We have a Savior to rest in. He supplies all of our needs. He gives us the strength to go through it. I want us to understand that Jesus said that his purpose, uh, uh, as he finished his ministry in John chapter 17, he says this in verse 3, uh, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. What is the point of all of that? The point is that when we don't, uh, when we put our understanding in the fact that okay, if I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I'm saved. Now I'm okay for the, just kind of live life the way I used to without, without, without compromising what I like for what Jesus wants. Jesus is saying that's not being a follower of me. You need to be willing to go through some hardships and let that go and say at least I have. Because can I, can I tell you? With him, we have everything we need. We have more than enough. Jesus is not just enough. He's more than enough. And so we need to have a dedicated relationship with him. Uh, Jesus isn't really interested in having groupies. He doesn't want you just to come because he seems to be famous for a moment. There was a time in American society where it was expected of people to go to a church. Not just on Sunday, uh, but uh, almost every day of the week, they were expected as soon as if the doors were open, were there, which is a great attitude to have. But they, peop, many people, which we found out later on, uh, they didn't go because they love Jesus. They go because society expected it of them. And that's the wrong reason to follow Jesus. The right reason is he's God. He's the Savior. He redeemed you from your sin. So it's not about coming to church because it's expected of us. It's about coming. Uh, uh, it's about following him. 
day in and day out because he is worthy. He's not interested in groupies. Groupies will end. As anybody who's, who's watched any kind of band life, you'll understand that the groupies come and go. Right? Band come and go. But Jesus is eternal. He's forever. And if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, can I tell you, you'll follow him through thick and thin. He's not just interested in having people follow him. He's interested in changing people's lives to redeeming them from sinful nature, to having a life with him for all eternity. He was interested in changing the leopard's spot, not the leopard's spot, the leopard's sickness, the servant who nobody cared about, who people thought were second-rate citizens. And he made them something far greater than just those. Now they're people that Jesus testimonies for him for all eternity. It's written in his eternal book dedicated relationship to him this is something that um jc riley said and he said it uh it, it, i don't agree with everything he said of course but this was a great saying he says this nothing in fact has been has done more harm to christianity than the practice of filling the ranks of christ's army even uh, with every volunteer who is willing to make a little profession getting saved tell you when you get saved when a sinner comes to repentance god celebrates it says there's a rejoicing in the presence of the angels that tells me god is jumping for joy he's thanking he's saying thank the lord they or thank myself that they turn from their wicked ways and they trust in me but can i tell you if you're not dedicated to follow jesus christ uh jesus wasn't interested in following them and can i can i just say this uh real quick he had 12 that followed him almost to the end but at the end, there was only one through his death, and that was John. That was John. One sent him, sold him out. One of them, Jesus said, had a devil. Judas is Not everybody who says, I'm going to follow Jesus, is going to be a follower of Jesus. Where's your heart? Are you, do you have a dedicated relationship with Jesus Christ? Uh, this is a fun message to preach before Easter Sunday because I come to the reality uh, of church and, and ministry and, and helping people find Jesus Christ. Okay, I didn't just make a little profession. I trusted Christ with my soul, and I want to follow him as best I can by his grace and his mercy so I can grow and become a help to others. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of something greater than just myself. When you become saved, you're greater. You're part of some, someone greater than anything. Someone greater than Solomon. Someone wiser than him, at least. Someone greater who, who has all the riches in all the, all the universe. And so we have a God who is so far above our understanding, and yet he says, come on, I want you. Would you come? Would you have a dedicated relationship with the Lord? If you're saved today, would you start to him again and say, I will follow you you lead lord despite the fact that it may send me uh it may send me to where there's no in and out burger no sorry no in and out forget it it's bread the dedicated listen there's some great food in costa rica you gotta they they do some great stuff well yeah you gotta understand that will it take you to places you don't want to go jesus might but can I tell you, when you're there, following the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to want to be there. You're going to want to do it. You got to have that dedicated relationship. All right. So we've seen the scribe. Now, I want us to see uh, this other man for a moment. He's, uh, he's a guy. He's uh, he, he seems to be sitting under Jesus, listening to him and following and agreeing and, and going through it. But then, uh, then he has a problem. He says, and another disciple, a learner of Jesus, said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus says, but uh, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. He says this, look, there's a cost. It's going to be a disturbed rest. Um, not that you're going to be waking up tonight, but how many of you wake up anyway? Middle of the night to get up, go to the Maybe you're like me, you drink too much water, and you get up four times a night, you just use the bathroom. Right? I hate that when it happens. I get up, and I'm thinking, oh, man, where am I? And I have to go use the restroom, and the kids leave something in the hallway, and I step on it, and it just ruins my whole night, right? Just horrible. But I'm not talking about that kind of disturbed rest. Now, this is something 
very interesting. As we, as we study this passage, it seems like Jesus is saying to this person, your dead father isn't important. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Uh, for the Jewish person, during the first century, as he, uh, as he would learn from rabbis and from Pharisees, they would often put uh, extra fences around the law so that they might not even come close to breaking the law. Jesus said eventually that became breaking the law anyway. Uh, but as they would put extra guardrails around the law, uh, they would put extra requirements for individuals uh, and, and call that being God. And the problem with that is, is that God never told them to do these things. So for instance, I want us to understand that when he comes to Jesus telling him to let the dead bury the dead, there's really two two thoughts. Uh, one is that uh, uh, let the spiritual dead de- the spiritual dead. Um, I can understand that, but somebody who takes the Bible literally, I don't completely follow that. Uh, he, this is talking about an actual situation. Either this guy's dad was dying or was dead. And there was a, f- a funeral procession coming on. And for the Jews, uh, they would have to, by, by law, by, in, the De- in Deuteronomy, it tells them to take, uh, take the time and bury immediately. Not, not just like we do a week later. Immediately they had to go in the And then take seven days because they were unclean by touching or being around a dead person. They had to take seven days of purification. And that was called their seven days of mourning. It was called the Shabbat is what they called it. And, it. and it was something that God kind of said would follow. Uh, and, and that seems kind of normal. Okay, Jesus, can I just take a, can I take a week off? I'm going to bury my dad, and then I'll come catch up with you on the other side of the, the Sea of Galilee. That seems kind of reasonable, right? Why is Jesus saying don't? No, just go let the dead bury the dead. Uh, because it didn't stop there. So for the first century Jew, because of these guardrails that they set up around them, it wasn't just these a morning period after seven days, uh, they would uh, they would spend another thirty days of extended morning. Uh, this was called uh, the uh, forgive me, looking it up here. That was called the Shalai, Shalaiha, and I I, I'm, I can't remember really pronounce it well. So there's the Shiva, the seven day morning, but then there's the Shalaya, which was take about thirty days. And in that thirty day process, they would go every uh, at the end of the week. And they would open up the tomb to see if that body had completely decayed. And once it decayed, they would take the bones of that dead person and put them in a chest and then rebury them. And so they would be unclean for another seven days. Now this is law. This is something taken from when Joseph asked the nation of Israel to take his body back into the uh, back into the land of Canaan to bury him. And that happened years after. This process would take months sometimes. And so what this person, this disciple is saying, he's trying to really find a way out almost, it seems like. He's saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you again after I bury my dad. And for us, it seems, okay, a week, two weeks, maybe. But for a Jew, that was two, three months, sometimes even a year. The mourning period would continue tell the bones of that person were completely uh, encapsulated in this other chest in, in, a, in the tomb next to its family members. And for us to, uh, to see this individual, we need to understand it was a time really of excuse to get out of work, to get out of religious exercise, and to get out of a dedicated relationship with their Savior. And so we need to understand the cost of following Jesus It's going to disturb our rest going to tell you, our rest shouldn't just in the seven hours, nine hours of sleep we get a night. It's not just in the vacations. Our rest is in Jesus Christ. So if we try to remove ourselves from the rest that is Jesus, then we really don't get a good rest at all. Spiritually, we need to rely on him. That rest we have. And he's not saying that going and burying your dad. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that if we uh, don't provide for, his, for our own, uh, uh, specific, specifically for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an exile. The problem wasn't fulfilling the fifth commandment of honoring his father for this disciple. The problem was he's using all of this as excuse not to follow Jesus these laws. He's got God right before him, and God says, don't, don't worry about that. Follow me. Don't worry about all that stuff. He's not saying don't bury the guy. 
He's saying, don't worry about all that extra traditional uh, 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 religious stuff. Follow him. Follow him. If you follow Jesus and you learn, learn from him, you will be able to have a dedicated relationship. And yeah, you might have some disturbed rest, but can I tell you, if you rest in Jesus Christ, even your sleepless nights are wonderful. I want us to see in Matthew what Jesus says about uh, this problem of putting extra traditional laws in, uh, to try to keep us from breaking the commandments and God's character. Uh, I want us to see what he says about this in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 9, or 1 through 9. He says, Then came Jesus, or to Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition? Did you get that? Tradition of who? Not God, the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, honestly, I'd be disgusted. If you went into the bathroom and you flushed and I didn't hear the water running and you came to my dinner table, I'd say, go back in there and wash your hands. I'd be honestly disgusted. But Jesus didn't have a problem with it. Look at what he says. But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? He's saying you transgress the, the law and the tradition of our elders. And Jesus says you're transgressing God's law by putting your law as, as equal to God's law. Look what he says. For God did saying, honor thy father and thy mother. So God has no problem with your mother and your father. In fact, he, in, he designed it. <laughs> he created it. And he that curseth, his, uh, curseth father and mother, uh, let him die the death. That's pretty strong lingo. Right? Jesus says the death penalty uh, should happen if you disobey or dishonor your parents. Watch out, kids. Jesus is, all right, yeah, I wanted to hear that from a mom or dad. That's right. No. <laughs> but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift. By whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me. He's basically saying that if something to your parents, really, you're giving it to yourself. When I was a kid, uh, we were celebrating my mom's birthday, and we had just got a Nintendo system, right? Nintendo 64, awesome, great thing. It was sweet. And, and, and uh, I had heard that my mom liked Donkey Kong, you know, and I didn't realize it was the old Donkey Kong. So we're at the GameStop. Well, before GameStop, there was different stores. We, went, we were there looking at the things, and, and I saw Donkey Kong Country. And I was like, oh, Mom, I love this, and I'd love it too. And uh, I'm going to buy this, and I'm going to give it to my mom, but I know that she works, and she has to take care of the house, so I know I'm going to be playing it. And in the back playing out in my head all right it's going to seem like i love my mom and i'm going to be able to enjoy this as myself when i gave it to her she looked at it she says really when am i have time to do this I said, right that's the kind of guy i was so giving that's what jesus is saying he's saying if you do things for your parents you say oh it's a gift to you but really it's meant to give yourself some pleasure and profit you're actually breaking the commandment of honor Look what it says, ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, that's Isaiah, saying, the people draweth nigh with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Listen, if the Bible doesn't dogmatically say something, we shouldn't. But can I, well, let's kind of warn too. If it does, we should. We need to understand that sometimes traditions get in the way of worshiping God. We need to evaluate something. By the way, this is a tradition. I don't know what I'm on this, but this is something I just learned. When we do the Lord's table, right, uh, we, have, we have the tray here. And on top of the tray is a little an ornament where you, it's a cover for either the bread or the, the juice. It's a cover. It has a little cross on it. Ours does at least. And, and I didn't realize this, but that didn't start, they didn't start covering it until about the 1800s and they started covering it because uh, churches had windows that would open and in fact if you want to come to my house i'll show you a church that's just like it the windows open to let the breeze come in because there wasn't anything called air conditioning right they let the breeze come in but what would come in as well as flies and bees and stuff like that so they covered it to keep the flies out so as it was being passed you wouldn't get a wafer with a, a fly on it Right, because that kind of pollutes the purpose, right? It's supposed to be Christ, representing Christ's body. Uh, so that's a tradition. Now, uh, now I still would like to have the cover on it because, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, flies get in here from time to time. It's a good tradition to have. 
If, you, we, if we don't have that on there, we're breaking God's commands. We're actually saying we didn't read the Bible. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to have a tray even to have the bread. They passed it. They passed the cup. But I don't want to drink after you. So we have little individual cups. Jesus is saying, look, you worship me in vain. If you're keeping to these traditions, but you're breaking the, the, uh, you're breaking the relationship, you're not having a relationship with him. You're worship, worshiping him with your mouth, but your heart is far from God. You'd rather have the traditions, the comfort of those things, rather than put towards this dedicated relationship in Jesus Christ. If you're going to follow him, you need to count the cost. You need to understand that it's, it, it, you need to worship him more than your family. You need to put him first in your life, and you need to grow in that, uh, in that ability to yes to him. And, and can I tell you, Jesus is merciful, uh, and he wants to comfort you in your morning times, and he wants to help you through those morning times to give him the glory. Remember, Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. He was against the mourning period. But what he was saying is, if you put that above him, you're an idolater. You need to count the cost. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we mourn the death of a loved one, sometimes, sometimes the best thing we need is rest. In fact, there are some times that we're so in shock after a death of a loved one that a doctor would give us some sleeping medication to help our body recover from the shock and emotional damage that happened. But the greatest rest that you could have is in Jesus Christ. You may have some disturbed rest. By the way, we're going to have sorrows. All that live godly shall suffer persecution. We're going to have some sorrows. But our rest needs to be anchored in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is helping them understand that it's not about this light acceptance of him being a good teacher or even a strong leader. It's about him being God. Him being able to sustain you through all of this. He is going to suffer for the death of, or for the sins of the world. He's going to be the one that gives, uh, gives hope to millions. In fact, he's the one that's going to, like we learned in the vacation hour this morning, that's going to rise the dead up that believe in him from the grave and then catch us that are remaining up with him as well. And he's going to give us eternal life, eternal rest with him. He's the one that gives that, and our focus should be on him. I want us to see in, uh, uh, in Luke this uh, reference, this account in Luke. Luke says it this way to the man who said, Let me go bury my father. Uh, Jesus saith unto him, this is the account, he says, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. He said our priority should be first the kingdom of God. Right? And as we grow, we'll have the ability through these relationships and through the lack of rest, hear the direct response of God. The kingdom of heaven is the first priority. Jesus is. By the way, in a church, in a family, in and in a, we can say even a government, if we don't put Jesus as our main priority, it will crumble. If we don't say God is our, our, our goal, or God is our refuge, uh, our, his, Jesus is our rock and His teachings are what we build our life upon, then, uh, then, then we're going to crumble. And Jesus tells it directly. Look at go to Go to that last verse, would you, with me? Uh, he says this. Jesus says, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Again, this isn't that blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus that you see uh, throughout Facebook. It seems like he couldn't hurt a fly. He would be so gentle with you that he's not going to offend you despite what you believe. Jesus is telling you directly that's temporary. This world is temporary. He is eternal. He is what matters. And we follow him for something far greater. We can preach the kingdom of heaven to the people who are lost and dying. And we have that direct relationship with him and he is always direct with us in response uh, Luke chapter 14 verses 28 through 32 look at this he says for which of you, remember counting the cost which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether ye have sufficient uh, to finish it 
after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who hold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. For what king, going to make war against other king, uh, sitteth down first and consoleth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him, or twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, with an ambassador and desire uh, conditions of peace. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, count the cost. Count the cost. It's just, not only is it wise business, it's great for you as a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's count the cost. Can I tell you, if you count the cost, you'll find that the end of it is worth it. The conclusion of Jesus Christ is not only do you get to preach the kingdom of heaven, you're a part of the kingdom of heaven. If you have your Bible, go with me to Matthew. Again, go to the, go to the next verse. Matthew 20, uh, forgive me here. Uh, Matthew chapter 8. And uh, let's, look, let's look further on in the text. Matthew 8, and let's look at verse 20, uh, 23. Look at what happens. This is a whole other section that we'll look at in a few weeks. This is after he told the guy to go dead and then he says and he was entered into a ship and his him and behold there arose a great temptest in the sea and so much that the ship was covered with the waves but he was asleep and his disciples came to him and woke him and saying lord save us we perish and he saith unto him why are ye uh, fearful ye of little faith and there uh, then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The end, the conclusion of following Jesus is calm, is peace, is joy. Hey, it's long-suffering, it's gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. against such there is no law. The end of following Jesus is Jesus himself. And if, you, if that's not enough for you, can I tell you, uh, you need to rethink who Jesus is. He is God. He created a purpose, and that purpose was to glorify Him. Love Him, to fear Him, and to honor Him. And we can grow in our relationship with Him as we have this direct relationship with Him. And as we see God growing us through this relationship, there's going to be times where our peace is kind of disturbed, but He is our rest. And then uh, He will have direct responses to the way the word of god will help you not just in your faith to believe but it also help you in your everyday life jesus didn't come to the religious he came to everyone and taught them how to live their lives according to what god had told them and if we do as G hebrews chapter 12 says verses 1 through 2 Wherefore, if we follow this, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so doth easily beset us. Some people believe that's unbelief. Some people think that's pride. I think, I think really it's just understanding that we're sinful people and we'll let Jesus be Jesus. Look what he says here. So uh, run the race with patience, or let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you decide to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to count the cost. But in counting the cost, look at the conclusion. The conclusion is eternity. The conclusion is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be with us now as we're closing the service. I thank you that you are a God who, who is merciful and mighty. I thank you that you are, Jesus, you are who, who told us to count the cost. You didn't just come in and just uh, and, and, and let people uh, make a profession. You told them there's a cost. For the Jew, that meant that meant breaking tradition. For, for an individual in the first century, sometimes turning away from false gods to you and leaving even their family uh, who didn't understand. And Lord, today in our society, coming to you in faith, sometimes it just means a change of scenery. 
Sometimes it just means a few people will mock us at work. Or and Lord, I pray that you'd help us to count the cost of following you. See, the conclusion is, is glory. Glory. Being a part of something far greater, telling others about the fact that Jesus died and he was buried and rose again on the third day so that they might have forgiveness of sins and new life in him and that this life is something far greater than what uh, what we used to have and as a believer lord help us to understand that 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 counting the cost means understand that means going forward uh in, in sometimes a scary situation sometimes it's it's an unknown that we are afraid of and and god by faith we can we can go forward in this unknown trusting you who is Lord, I thank you that whatever you want to happen, you provide for. I'm thankful, Lord, that you are a God that uh, consoles us. You're a God that comes along and you, you tell us things directly. Thank you, God, that we are in such a time where the gospel be freely preached without fear of government repercussions. Thank you, God, that we're a part of a time as this where following you um, may mean uncomfortable times, but it also means great reward simply by having your name glorified. With head bowed and eyes closed, I wonder today's history.